Hello everyone. My name is Sam Hagen. I am part of the public programming team at the State Library of New South Wales. Welcome to your library at home for another in our series of author talks. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that we meet today on country. I live and work on Gadigal land and I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to any Aboriginal Australians who may be joining us this evening. So one of the nicer things to have happened during the COVID lockdown has been seeing people spending quality time with their pets. I don't know if the pets have enjoyed it as much, but I know a lot of people who've really enjoyed taking all those walks with their dogs. With that in mind, we thought we'd invite Kate Lever to come and talk about her timely new book, which is called Good Dog. She's going to be in conversation with the lovely Melanie Tate, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But before I do, I'd like to remind you that the library will be opening our two main reading rooms on Monday, the 1st of June, that's next Monday. And as excited as we obviously all are, we will be working to keep everyone safe. So before you visit, make sure you go to the State Library's website, www.sl .nsw.gov.au, where you'll find some helpful FAQs uh, about how to come and book in to visit us at the library. We're so excited to be seeing you again and opening up our doors. Now to some housekeeping. We will be taking Q&As at the end of this chat. So there is a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, just type it in there and I'll be monitoring that and then jumping back on at the end of the talk. But now I'd like to introduce the lovely Melanie Tate. Melanie is an award-winning playwright, journalist, author, and radio maker. She's currently the executive producer of podcasts at Mamma Mia Women's Network. Melanie, are you there? I am indeed, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm so excited to be talking about this book, Good Dog, tonight. For the State Library of New South Wales. It's a book that's big heart couldn't be more ad or more apt for the times we're living through right now where really we need companionship and beautiful stories to uplift us. Its author is a very clever Kate Lever who over the last few years has built up the kind of career that any of us who write are very very jealous of. She's an in-demand freelance journalist who's written for everybody from The Guardian to Vogue to JK Rowling's personal website and she's also the author of two books The Friendship Cure and now Good Dog. Kate spends her time between London and Sydney which again in normal times would be another thing to add to life goals. Uh, let's welcome Kate to our State Library of New South Wales Zoom chat. Kate, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you it's, for the lovely introduction. Oh, well, congratulations on a really beautiful book. And uh, a, have you got now, you've got Bertie. Bertie is the inspiration for this book. Is he with you tonight? I will summon Bertie to me. My boyfriend will bring him to me. <laughs> oh, you can summon. Oh, hello, Bertie. So, <laughs> wearing, wearing a bow tie for the occasion. Oh, now, can you, can you tell us a bit about how... Bertie inspired, well, whether Bertie did inspire this book as it goes. Oh, he definitely did. I, um, I was trying to think of what I was going to write about next um, in book form and essentially chose to write it about my favourite animal so that I would have an excuse to write thousands of words about this guy. Um, <laughs> the, whole, the book is not just about him, but it was certainly inspired by my love for him. Mm -hmm. um, my boyfriend and I... Uh, rescued him from a place called Battersea in London, or just outside of London actually, um, a couple of years ago um, on, the, on my boyfriend's birthday, the 29th of February. And um, basically since then, I've had a really, a bit of a rough depressive episode. And I discovered the superpower that Bertie has, which mm -hmm. is caring for me during those times. Um, oh, he's just wriggling around. He wants to sit on the <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, Bernie. Um, so basically, yeah, I was at home, I was in bed, I was unable to work, um, I was kind of just listless and unable to participate in my own life for a time. And during that period, he just lay across my body or across, you know, next to me and just refused to leave my side. And I truly believe that he knew something was wrong and was trying to do his best to comfort me. Um, which depending on how much of a dog person you are may sound mad,
but I've spoken to experts and they agree with me. So, <laughs> Well, this is the joy of this book is that all of those kind of hunches that many of us dog people have are borne out by science, which, yeah. which we can go on to talk about. But I want to sort of go back in your history of being a dog lover because Birdie's not the first dog that you've loved. Um, can you, have you always been a dog person? Yeah, I really have. I really have. I'm deathly allergic to cats um, and I just find them too aloof. Right. My, my character. I think I need the enthusiasm of a dog. Um, and I've, I've just always loved them. I, you know, I had a really thick book of dog breeds when I was little and I just used to read it obsessively. Um, I had puppies when I was little. That's Bertie's bottom just coming into frame there. He's stretching. Um, I had dogs when I was little, but we bought them from breeders um, and I sort of wasn't aware of the decision-making process in that. But as an adult, I've made the decision to go to rescue centers. Um, uh, when I was in my twenties, I adopted an elderly Shih Tzu called, well, her name was Natasha when we picked her up, but we called her Lady Fluffington. Um, and she was with us for six years and then she died when uh, she was 14 and that broke my heart. Um, oh, yeah. As anyone who's ever lost a pet will know, it's um, very real grief. Because, you know, they're a member of the family and it's, it's very sad. So that's been, it, it took me a few years to get over that and to feel as though I would have room in my life and my heart for another dog. Um, but in, in, in Lady Fluffington's honour, I was obsessed with the idea of getting another Shih Tzu. So that's why I just like trailed the, um, the rescue websites until I found a Shih Tzu. <laughs> and that was good. In terms of these magical qualities that, uh, that, Birdie has because I must confess I've got two dogs and I've also uh, suffered from depression over over many years. My dogs, I, I feel like I have the dogs that you know I'm the the mum of the sort of problem dogs. My <laughs> dogs are sweet, like they'll come and lie with me or they'll come and be, but they don't have that extra sense. I feel like, but I feel like Birdie is a very special dog by what you've described. Was Lady Fluffington? As she, was, she was, yeah, that's the first time I really discovered it because I also had, I mean, obviously I've been living with depression for a long time, so I had issues with it while I had her in my life. And, well, I think possibly with her, it was a little bit that she was old enough that she just fell asleep next to me and didn't bother to move. <laughs> but I found it equally comforting and yeah. beautiful. Um, and she really was a proper companion for me um, and as an adult. And um, she, I really cherished her and yeah I think she had a little bit of magic as well. So Kate when you decided to write this book I mean what what a beautiful challenge to set yourself to research dogs for I, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure for how long but can you tell us once you decided to write this book like how you shaped what was going to become the narrative and and what that research process was? Of course, of course. So started out uh, with Bertie and my theory that he could smell or at least somehow sense my depression. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically I wanted to make the case for why I think dogs, um, the dog-human bond is the most extraordinary cross-species relationship on the planet. Um, and I know cat people will disagree with me, but I stand by what I say. Um, so I sort of, I thought the best way to do that and I was to follow my instinct, which is just to tell stories. So I decided I would tell Bert's story and my story. Uh, because of course, every time I tell a dog's story, I obviously tell the story of the human being they live with. Um, and then I decided to compile a group of other dog stories that I could tell that all together as a narrative and in a book, would convince a person that dogs are really special. <laughs> um, and I knew that there was plenty of, like once I looked into it, I knew there was plenty of lovely research. So I wasn't just looking for a heartwarming story about a dog. I was looking for a remarkable story about a dog that was also backed by research. So for instance, I found a diabetic alert dog. So there's a teenage girl I met who trained her border collie to smell when she has high or low blood sugar and go and wake her parents to get help. Um, and she's extraordinary. She's only 17. She started training this dog when she was 13. So she had the, the wisdom and the experience to be able to train her dog at that time to do something that, that saves her life once a week. Um, but I, there's also plenty of lovely research on why dogs are able to do that, how dogs are able to do that, and how many different types of dogs are able to do that. So I knew there was enough sort of lovely 
rich information that I could add to the chapter. So it wasn't just a lovely story about a dog. It was a beautiful story about a dog and a person um, backed up with interesting stuff. And I did that same formula for every chapter. So I have a guide dog, um, a dog who works in a prison, a dog who works in a special needs school, um, an autism support dog for an 11 year old boy. Um, I just sort of got a cross section of different breeds and different types of stories. But the, the, the underlying message was that they are remarkable creatures and the friendship we are capable of having with them can be life changing. And that's what I wanted. And I, and I feel like I found a really good lineup of dog stories. You really did. And I'm glad you mentioned Pip, the diabetic dog, uh, the diabetic sensing dog, because I wanted to talk a bit in a bit more detail about Pip. But if we could just go back for a second. So the, the, the point, you know, the, the initial spring off of the book was for you to just to, to find out whether it was true that Bertie could sense your depression. What did you discover? Um, well, I was basically, I wanted to talk to a dog expert. So I found this um, professor called Stanley Cohen, who's I think Canadian. Um, and he's one of the leading canine behavioral experts in the world. He has a whole suite of best-selling books about dog behavior. And I just emailed him and I said, listen, I'm writing this book. I have this theory that my dog can smell depression. Am I crazy or is there something in that? And he basically came back to me and he was so sweet. And he said, you're not crazy. That's entirely possible. Um, because as, as we already know that dogs can smell Parkinson's disease. They can smell different types of cancer. And as I said, they can smell diabetes. Um, so it follows that perhaps depression or a, or a state of distress in general may have its own scent that we are not aware of. Um, or, you know, it's simply the sort of um, the smell of the stress hormone cortisol and perhaps they can smell that. Um, so he said it's entirely possible. We don't have um, sort of concrete evidence as yet. Um, I think there are other studies that get funded before whether dogs can smell depression. Um, but I hope that maybe there'll be a study one day. But he also said, you know, it's possible that your dog is aware of you being in distress from other clues that you give him. So for instance, you know, my body language, the fact that I'm inside all the time, not wanting to go outside, the fact that I don't change, you know, wear my usual clothes because he can tell when I put on outside clothes he gets excited because he thinks he's going to go outside um, so the, just my behavior might also be an indication that there's something wrong yeah. um, and his instinct is just to stay by me and um, offer comfort so another interesting story within the within and charming and lovely story within this uh, book and I think that that's something to keep reminding our uh, what do we call Zoomers or listeners or watchers tonight? <laughs> um, that this this is really a book that is going to make you feel warm and fuzzy, you know, and feel good about the world at the moment in a world that, you know, there's not a whole heap to feel great about at the moment. This book reminds us of a lot of beautiful things. And I really loved the story about Missy the autism pug. Can you tell us a little bit about Missy? I love Missy. Um... I went to visit Missy and her family, um, who's an 11 year old boy and his brother, though I didn't meet the brother, um, and his parents, they live in England. I went to meet them and Missy climbed onto my lap and left me covered head to toe in Missy hair. She has, she's one of those pugs that has a perpetually lops, a tongue, like mm -hmm. a tongue. So she kind of just gets about mm -hmm. like that. It's very funny. Um, anyway. Basically what happened is, um, there's Bertie coming to say hello. Hi Bertie. Um, <laughs> uh, this young boy has lived with autism all of his young life and it was really distressing to him. He would get angry, he would get scared. Um, he had a lot of difficulty going to school. He would often to threaten to hurt himself. Um, it was a, real, a really harrowing situation. Um, but through all of that, he sort of had this secret obsession, or perhaps not so secret. <laughs> he would talk to anyone who would listen about pugs. And his whole room is covered in pug paraphernalia. His bed linen, his money box, his clothes, his towels, everything has pugs on it. Um, so basically, his mum, he'd been through a really rough patch, and it was his birthday. And his mum went on Facebook and said, my son really loves pugs. She found a special pug group and said, if you have a 
a pug at home. Can you send a picture to us to cheer up my son? And it just, they just got an influx of pictures and messages and cards and gifts being sent to their home. And he went to a pug party at a pub and he basically transformed into a different person. It was like this sort of angry, scared child um, with a serious medical condition was suddenly like, hey, nice to meet you. Have you lost weight? How are you? Like he was sociable and chatty and confident and happy in a way that his, his mom almost didn't recognize her and child because he was so transformed just in the presence of these dogs. So obviously she said to her husband, it's time for us to get a pug. Um, so they went to this amazing pug rescue place in the UK where whenever they get a new pug, they name it after a dessert. So they have like banoffee pie and cherry cake and oh. they're all pugs. Um, and they finally got matched with a five-year-old deaf pug called Missy. And Missy had had a rough time too. She was used for breeding and she lived outside of a house and it was a sad beginning to life. Um, so she was very pleased to come into a loving family. And his, his life has changed dramatically since that, since that meeting. Um, and it's a really lovely story. Kate, is there any research that's done around why it's a dog or a pug? that a child like that would be attracted to and calmed by as opposed to a guinea pig or yeah. or a, a, a ferret or the like <laughs> i'm sure i mean i'm sure there's someone in the world who has an emotional support ferret um but i think there's just something particularly generous and gentle about a dog's nature not every dog obviously um but pugs are sweet natured and gentle they can get a bit hyperactive when they get excited but in general they love a cuddle um, they're affectionate they're, they're sweet they cover you in fur but if you're okay with that then you can get past it um, i think dogs just have a unique ability to connect with us as creatures and that that autism support pug just knows how to be present in that little boy's life and she's patient with him and she's there when he needs her. And he, you know, she doesn't ask him complicated questions like all the adults in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't have to justify himself or defend himself. She can never be mean to him. Um, there's a lot that he can get from her that he cannot get from the people in his life, even the ones who love him. So Kate, you mentioned a little bit before Pip, the diabetic awareness dog. Um, this is a really extraordinary story as well in two parts because like you mentioned the the young girl training this dog over many years kind of on a on a hope that it might yeah out can you tell us their story and and how it is that that this dog is able to do this extraordinary thing um, so it's this wonderful young girl called Katie Gregson who is a huge cricket fan and a high school student um, and she was living with diabetes. Um, it was severe, um, really affected her life. Um, now that she's old enough, she mm. sort of controls, manages the condition herself. She tests her own blood sugar. She has a little thing that alerts her when it's too high or low. She does her own insulin, that sort of thing. Um, but when she was younger, that wasn't always possible. And um, it can be very dangerous for someone to go hypo or hyper while they're asleep. Um, so she decided to train the dog to basically stay awake at night and monitor her, uh, which is remarkable. The dog sleeps, the dog is basically a shift worker. She sleeps during the day so that she can stay up and watch Katie during the night, um, which is remarkable. But essentially what she did was over an 18 month period, she trained her dog Pip to recognize the smell of high or low blood pressure and then alert her parents. And it was sort of in stages, like I think for six months, she just, she would put her saliva on a cotton wool bud and then put it in a little pot and freeze it so she could keep it as a sample. And for a while, she just trained the dog to react when he smelt, when she smelt that smell. And then she sort of, over the next six months, worked to make sure that the dog associated that smell with her. 
and then to make the alert to the parents when she smelt that smell, which sounds like when I first heard it, I almost didn't believe it because it sounds so remarkable, but it happens, it works. You know, like her accuracy rate is incredible. And if this young girl is ever in, in danger, her dog goes and gets a parent. She's obviously old enough now that she probably doesn't need her parents trudging into her bedroom <laughs> to wake her up and make sure she's okay. Um, but that's what she trained the dog to do. So the dog goes into the parent's bedroom. It's amazing. It's like something from a movie, don't you think? Yeah. A Hollywood movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, rights are available. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, Kate, what other extraordinary medical things did you discover about the things that dogs can... You know, there, there are, like you said, the smelling of depression. There's the, uh, the, the kind of... I'm not going to say urban myth because your book, you know... <laughs> about the smelling of cancer, the smelling of Parkinson's that you yeah. mentioned before. What, what's the actual evidence on all of that? Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable and pretty convincing. Like at the moment, a dog sniff test is actually more reliable than some of the t medical tests we have for something like testicular cancer. Um, so I don't, I don't know. How? How? Yeah, I, I don't know. But that, like I just, I truly don't understand it, but it's true. The accuracy there is just better. Um, there's a remarkable TED talk on dogs being able to smell out malaria. And again, their accuracy rate is amazing. I mean, there's a very sweet demonstration on stage where a malaria sniffing dog comes on and correctly identifies socks that have been uh, contaminated by malaria. Mm. Um, and it's quite remarkable. And they even try and trick her by putting ones that have nothing on it. And she's like, please try me. I know there's no malaria on the sock. Um, it's it's a incredible stuff. I think they're just, I mean, at the moment, they're training dogs over in the UK uh, to possibly be able to smell COVID-19. So they're just the most remarkable creatures and so much more valuable to us even than they are as pets. Um, and that was truly astounding to me. Um, also, just on a more basic level, just from one person to one dog, we know that stroking them as I am stroking Bertie right now or making eye contact with them um, causes oxytocin to flood in our bodies, which is, of course, that lovely hormone that encourages us to feel trusting and loving and warm and safe. Um, and, and the same thing happens for them as we're doing that, as we're looking into their eyes or stroking them, they're also getting an increase in oxytocin, which is really comforting and lovely, loving um, for both dog and human. So on a basic level, they just make us feel happier and more comfortable in our lives. It's a beautiful, it's such a beautiful thing. The, um, the, the uh, one other dog I want to talk about and then the research that you found out, you know, that sort of backed this up is Teddy, the little sh schnoodle. Oh my God, I love Teddy. Homer schnoodle. Can you tell us a bit about Teddy? <laughs> I love Teddy. Teddy was actually, uh, Teddy and his, his human, um, Andy. Uh, that was the first interview I did actually. And it, we're off to a good start, apart from the fact that Teddy's owner has quite a thick accent and my transcribing software that I was using really freaked out and I couldn't, it was a real research hurdle. But Teddy, <laughs> um, Teddy is a beautiful schnoodle who has uh, stayed by his owner through cancer, through pneumonia, and actually since I wrote the book, since, uh, through a heart attack. Um, and Teddy has just been this remarkable dog who stays by the owner's side. But uh, perhaps the most amazing thing that Teddy did was actually wake Andy up from a coma. So um, Andy got pneumonia, he's 65, it was a really risky situation. Um, they decided to put him into a medically induced coma, but obviously they wanted him to come back out of that. And uh, his wife, who, his now ex-wife, but then wife, um, just decided to sneak Teddy in a supermarket bag into the hospital ward and with the nurse's permission, because nurses are wonderful people, um, and put Teddy on the bed and Teddy did one solitary stubborn bark and licked Andy on the face and Andy just came to. Um, and they tried other things to get him to come out of the coma and this is the one thing that worked. And I think maybe on some kind of unconscious level, he just knew that the dog needed him and he was like, yes, I'm here, my favorite creature. Um, and then together they spent many, many weeks recovering in bed and then um, building his strength back up by doing between one and four walks in the park every day. Um, and he credits Teddy for his recovery. 
Um, and now Teddy works in the same hospital that Andy was in as a therapy dog and mostly comforts stroke patients, which I think is just a beautiful story of, mm. you know, Andy recognising what Teddy did for him and wanting to be able to give that gift to other people. Mm. Look, that's a, that's a really lovely, you know, way to see again to what I'm, one of the exciting things about this book is, you know, it's so hard sometimes if you're um, not a dog person to get dogs, particularly, and you'll, you'll often have families divide over whether to welcome a dog into their home. Yeah. You conclude the book with a whole heap of really uh, wonderful, interesting factoids about the kind of longevity living with a dog gives you, the kind of health benefits just having one in your home can do. Can you just take us through a few of those for anybody that's watching that is needing, they need that arsenal to be able to say, look, basically you're going to live longer if you. Yeah. Well, get that's them. true. That's the most compelling argument. Um, some lovely research is actually very recent. I think one of the studies I mentioned was literally from last year, which is when the book was being published. Um, but what, when it was going to print, but um yeah, dogs, living with dogs makes us live longer, partially possibly because of the lovely hormones I mentioned earlier, the lowering of our stress hormone cortisol, which they do in so many different lovely ways, but um, also the fact that people who own dogs are more likely to be active because they have to take their dog outside, more likely to spend time in nature. Um, dogs also have a social element. They help us make friends with other people and with other dogs. And there's all sorts of things that really bolster our immune system, um, our mental health, but also our physical health, which I found really interesting because obviously I knew from experience they're good for mental health, but I didn't realize that they also protect us from things like heart attacks, stroke, cancer, any sort of ailment you can mention, there's a little bit of research that suggests that having a dog in your life should make you less susceptible to them, um, which I think is pretty compelling. You know, cuteness is one argument, but if you need something more serious, yeah. is someone to get a dog, then the longevity of your life is pretty compelling. It was really interesting. I feel like I, I should have highlighted it, but there was one factoid towards the end about life after having a stroke and a heart attack. If you have a dog, yeah, Do you know what? off the top of my head, I can't remember the figures, but they Something are good. <laughs> Let me just see if I can find it because I think that it's so. I should have marked this out. Um, Thirty. For those who had had a stroke, the risk of dying was 27% lower if you lived with a dog. There's another even good way. I should have just found it. We're running out of time, unfortunately. We've got. I can see we've got a bunch of questions down oh, here. Oh, great. So shall I um, get to some of these questions? Let's see. So uh, let's see. Vanessa, uh, let's see. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, Vanessa wants to know what special powers are unique to certain breeds. Did you discover that? Oh, great. great. Michelle wants to know that too. I, I, do you know what? That's a great question and I would love to know the answer to that. Really all I discovered was that Labradors and Golden Retrievers are exceptional in terms of learning to do special things like going to guide dog school and being a court companion and working in schools. So any sort of... Um, place a charity or organization that works with therapy dogs will often go for those breeds because they're just so intelligent and gentle natured. Um, but even within that, there's like a 50% failure rate for guide dogs in guide dog school. So it's, it's oh, really, yeah, <laughs> they get other jobs though. They get to be therapy dogs. Um, right. So their nature is particularly wonderful, which I know because my dad and stepmom have a golden retriever and she's pretty special. But apart from that, I'm not entirely sure, but I am convinced. I'm not sure that each individual breed has special superpowers so much as um, any breed can have a remarkable dog. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are emotional support chihuahuas emotional support, Dobermans, I'm sure, not that I've met one. Um, but I think there's no evidence to suggest that there are, there are, there are particular, particular being wonderful and able to train to do things. You know, therapy dogs are actually trained, emotional support dogs are actually trained to do tasks that improve someone's life. And there's no evidence to suggest that any breed couldn't do it. Um, so all breeds are wonderful, that's my message. Right, right. <laughs> because there, there, 
quite surprised that two schnoodles had made it into the, um, the five, five <laughs> little oodles. And they, they, like I said, they're special to me, but I don't know if they're special out there in the big wide world. So, so I across the board. Yeah. And to be honest, like the humble Shih Tzu, I, before I owned two Shih Tzus, I don't think I would have suspected that this little creature would be capable of empathy and comfort and, you know, that sort of stuff. But they are, they are. Well, Kate, another question we've got here from Amanda. She wants to know, is there a particular breed that's better at sniffing out diseases? And this is an interesting one. You know, when you hear about how beagles, like I would never have a beagle because they love smells more than they love us and they're very hard to, to <laughs> get back, you know, as hunting dogs. Um, are, there, are there particular breeds that, that are more sensory to diseases? I think so. I'm not sure. Um, in my research, there were beagles. Um, there was a pug, which I found really surprising. I wouldn't have thought they were, um, you know, appropriate to be trained to do that sort of medical work, but mm -hmm. I stand corrected. Um, I think sort of spaniels might also be good. Um, I don't know, it, it sort of it depends a little bit on the disposition, disposition of the individual dog. I really laughed when I was doing some research and found that there are certain dogs who just chose to nap or snack instead of doing the training that they were required to do. So they were let go from the program, um, which I thought was really right. funny. But um, I don't think That's there are- way to them, don't you think? Yeah, exactly. It's a good life decision. They're not cut out for the work and that's fine. So I think, you know, in every species, in every breed, there are the ones that are good and the ones that are not appropriate for the work. There are ones who are designed to, you know, nap and snack for the rest of their days and that's okay too. Uh, Marcello wants to know, did it take a long time to build the trust between you and Bertie? Uh, yeah, it did. That's a great question because um, it's a good question as an example of what can happen when you get a rescue dog, um, which I still believe is the right thing to do. Um, we brought him home when he was about nine months old, which was much younger than I had wanted. I usually go for elderly dogs, um, but he had some problems. He used to bite me quite badly, um, mostly on the hands and legs, once on my left nipple, which was very unpleasant. Ooh, yeah. um, <laughs> He drew blood a few times, um, but it was basically because he hadn't been socialized with other puppies and he didn't know what hurt. So we did a bit of reading on it and found that you're meant to make a yelping noise when they bite you and it hurts, just like a puppy would, kind of like, oh, um, he reacted to that. Um, yeah. So whenever he bit me, I would make a distressed noise and quite quickly he, he learned that he was hurting me and he didn't want to do that. It wasn't his intention, so he stopped biting me. Um, but it did, he did kind of howl through the night and we on our sofa a lot when we would go out. Not that we would left him very much when we first got him. Um, so it was a difficult teething period, but I think you get that with, mm. if you get a, you know, a puppy from a breeder, you're still going to deal with them not being able to sleep at night for the first little while. So there were teething issues, but just with consistency and a routine and love and him knowing that he was going to get meals um, and reliable care. He just learned to trust us and learned to trust our home as his home. Um, and now he's basically, in my opinion, flawless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're fast running out of time. I've got two more questions I want to ask yeah. you. And um, the first is, what do you think dogs have meant to people during this period of lockdown? And isolation. I know I have a, somebody who lives alone. I feel I shouldn't say I live alone because I live with two little dogs and they have, they've been my sanity. They've, they've been a, a, a legal reason to go out twice a day. They've been company. Um, what, what do you think they have meant for, for people around the world in terms of that isolation? I mean, I think it's been incredible. I think a lot of pets have been living their best life because they suddenly have their people home all the time for attention. Yeah. Um, but I think for us, it's been really important. I think probably most people already knew this about their pets, but perhaps they've been reminded more so than ever just how comforting they can be, how joyous they can be. My dog makes me laugh every day because he's ridiculous and so sweet. Um, the comfort, like the physical affection, also the needing to get outside to take them for a walk is routine when otherwise we might not have that much routine if we're working from home or out of work at the moment. Um, and that consistency can be really comforting and lovely. 
Um, I think also a lot of new people are discovering the joy of dogs because apparently um, fostering is going crazy and people are taking dogs home because they have so much time to look after them, which I think is lovely. I mean, obviously a dog is forever, not just for a pandemic. So I hope that the people who are adopting dogs, you know, are committed to looking after them for the rest of their days. Um, but I think it's remarkable and delightful how much comfort our animals are giving us through a very anxious and strange time. Mm. My, my final question would be, you know, quite often uh, us dog lovers are accused of anthropomorphizing. I always get that word wrong. Did I get it right? I think I, I did. You nailed it, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, of anthropomorphizing our animals. Um, mm. Do you, I mean, is there, is there a truth in the fact that, you know, we, they do things for treats, they do things for food, or do you believe there really is an actual emotional connection between dog and their, their human? Um, I think both can be true. I think a lot of dogs are food motivated, but I also think, or, you know, treat or, or praise motivated, um, and that can be true. But I also think it's true that there's a deeper emotional connection between a person and their dog than uh, cat people would uh, believe. <laughs> and, or, you know, dog skeptics would believe. Or ferret people. Ferret or ferret people. people, ferret people. I've never met a ferret person, but I'm sure they exist. Um, but I think if you have a dog and you do have an emotional connection with it, you know it to be true that there is that emotionally sophisticated range that they have. There's a lovely study that I write about in the book um, that tests whether dogs are capable of basic empathy. And the resounding answer was, yes, they are. Um, and I believe that to be true as well in my own experience. I think they do empathize with what we go through. And I think more often than not, they do what they can to help. You know, there are, there are mean dogs as well. Just like people, there are assholes in the dog world. I'm talking about the good ones <laughs> who are capable of emotional range. And one of those emotions is empathy. Um, and I think it's really lovely. Well, Kate, I've, I've got Bert's, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think you've got Bert's bottom in the-, in the Oh, that was lovely. That was lovely. <laughs> thank you, Bert. Um, Kate, thank you so much for your time tonight and for this absolutely beautiful well. book. Um, well, thank you for reading it. It is. It's a warm hug during a really difficult, you know, a difficult time. And it reminds us of the beautiful things that we have. If we are dog people and, and have dogs. Um, I might uh, thank you so much, Kate, and I'll hand it back to Sam now from the State Library of New South Wales. Hi, guys. Hi, Kate. Hi, Bertie. How are you going? Look at that face. <laughs> I should get Goldie. I should get Goldie and Mabel while we're yeah, don't while get Goldie and Mabel while we sign off. So thank you so much, Kate. That was great. Everyone enjoyed it, and it's so interesting to hear about that research as well. Um, I do have a quick question. Someone's asked me, uh, do you know the name of the doing the TED talk, or or if you don't, could you give me the name and then I'll put it up online on the State Library. Uh -huh. website. Off, the, off the top of my head, I do not know the name of the TED talk person, but if you Google TED Talk Malaria Dog. I okay. guarantee you get the right one. I think there's only one. TED Talk Malaria Dog. Last yeah, I'm sure it'll come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who is that, Melody? Oh, this is, so cool. this is oh, Goldie oh, Jeannie Penny oh. Kate. Yeah, Mabel's Mabel's asleep on the bed. There was no getting her off it. Say hi oh, to Birdie God. and Kate <laughs> and Sam. Hi. <laughs> thank you so much, you two. And um, thank you for everyone for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you back here very soon for another author event. In the meantime, I encourage you all to go out and buy a good dog. Um, especially you. now because, you know, it's the best time to be reading. <laughs> so have a great night. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.